welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. I have decided to cover an older case this week, and this is one that I've been reading about for a while. The murder of Florence Nightingale Shaw in 1920 captured my interest immediately after I heard about it, and namely due to the familiar and yet unusual name. Florence was the goddaughter of the famous Florence Nightingale, the founder of modern nursing. Florence Nightingale Shaw would unfortunately become known for her unfortunate and sad death, however, and it sent shockwaves throughout the local community. As always, this episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. Florence Nightingale Shaw was born on the 9th of January 1865 in Stamford, Lincolnshire. Florence came from a wealthy and well-known family that came from Derbyshire. The Shaw family were affluent, and Florence was part of a long line of industrious people, including her father, Offley Bohan Shaw. She was of course related to the famous Florence Nightingale, who had founded modern nursing and improved life chances for soldiers during the Crimean War. Her work improved the hygiene of both the soldiers and the staff treating them, and it meant that more lives were saved from infection and diseases. This gained her worldwide fame as the Lady with the Lamp, and she went on to advocate for sanitary reform and train other nurses in her way of working. She was Florence Shaw's godmother and related to her through her father William Shaw, who later took the name of Nightingale from his wife's uncle Peter Nightingale, who had left them a significant estate. Florence Shaw was connected to the famed Florence Nightingale in more ways than that, however. She was also a dedicated nurse. Florence believed wholeheartedly in the profession and gained her nursing certificate in Edinburgh, before also becoming a qualified midwife. Like her namesake, she treated soldiers during wartime, first in the South African War in 1900, and then in the First World War, being deployed in France. She was known to be courageous and brave, and often sacrificed her own safety to help injured soldiers. It's reported that she would refuse to enter the air raid shelters, so that she could help the injured, and this bravery was rewarded after the war as Florence gained war medals for her services. While in France, she worked for the Red Cross and the Queen Alexandra's Imperial Nursing Home. After the war had ended and Florence was demobilised, she returned back to England and continued to work as a nurse. It's reported that she began working in Ealing at the St Faith's Nursing Home for Gentle People, for maternity and acute chronic and convalescent cases. It's reported by contemporary news articles that Florence lived in Hammersmith in London during this period after the war. By January 1920, Florence had officially been demobilised and was now getting more time to visit family and friends. On January 12th, Florence had planned to visit friends in the seaside town of St Leonard's in Hastings, East Sussex. Florence travelled to London's Victoria train station with her old friend Mabel Rogers, who she had previously worked with. It was an afternoon train scheduled to set off to its destination at around 3.20pm. Mabel saw Florence off as she got on the train and it set off as planned. St Leonard's was just over 70 miles away and the trip was one that commuters and visitors took regularly. The train stopped first at Lewis, then at Polegate and then travelled on to Becks Hill. It was at Becks Hill that two men entered Florence's carriage and noticed something strange. They thought that they could see a woman sleeping at first glance. However, it wasn't long before they realised that something was wrong. The woman was wearing a fur hat and they could see blood starting to seep through onto the outside, making it visible to the men. It became obvious that the woman had suffered a number of injuries to her head. The men approached the woman and discovered that she was still breathing but obviously unconscious. They quickly contacted authorities to inform them about the woman's discovery and she was removed from the carriage and taken to Hastings Hospital. Police became involved and began investigating what had happened to the woman. The scene was violent and it appeared that some of Florence's belongings had been taken during the attack. She no longer had her train ticket on her and her money had also disappeared. It's reported that some jewellery had also been taken, a gold necklace and a diamond ring. This indicated that this brutal and unexpected attack may have been motivated by robbery. It did not take long for police to learn that the woman was Florence Nightingale Shaw, and they learnt of her background. 
In the subsequent hours, Florence had been taken to another hospital where she was in critical condition. Without the possibility of Florence making a statement about what happened to her, police were tasked with examining the carriage and trying to find witnesses that may remember what had happened. The train had been crowded on the journey that day and it was very busy with passengers coming and going. This of course did not help the officers when trying to track down witnesses. Police were able to make contact with Mabel Rogers, Florence's friend who had accompanied her to the train station that day. I am unsure how they knew to contact Mabel, however it is known that they sent a telegram to the Carnforth Lodge nursing home in Hammersmith where she worked and told her that she needed to travel to Hastings. Mabel travelled down immediately and arrived at the hospital to find that Florence was unconscious and in a critical condition. Mabel was horrified by what had happened to one of her closest friends and stayed close by her for the entire time that she was in hospital. Police questioned Mabel about what she had seen when she had been with Florence on the train. She said that she had accompanied Florence onto the train to find a seat. She explained that they went into one compartment which was busy and were told by one woman that the seat they'd found was engaged. The women then went into the next compartment which they found to be empty. It's reported in the Nottingham Journal and Express that Florence then took a right corner seat facing the engine. She had a dispatch box and an umbrella with her that day. Mabel then explained that around three minutes before the train started, a man came into the compartment. She stated that the man appeared to be a stranger to both her and Florence. Mabel explained that the man initially came into the compartment and sat on the same side of the train as Florence. He then proceeded to get up again a short time later. He also offered to hold the door open for Mabel, but she said she did it herself. While she explained that she didn't get a very good look at his face, she did give a description. She stated he was wearing a brownish tweed suit. He was around 5 feet 8 inches tall and was around 20 to 30 years old. He may have also had a coat over his arm, but she wasn't sure about this. She said when she tried to wave to Florence as she got off the train, the man was blocking her way as he was stood up. The description that Mabel gave to the police was distributed in the hope that someone else had noticed him that day. Sadly, on the evening of the 17th of January, Five days after the attack, Florence passed away. This was an incredibly sad time for those that knew Florence and it also meant that police were now searching for a murderer and they were still on the loose. The inquest into what happened to Florence was initially held just three days after her death. It was held by the coroner Mr Glenister who reportedly stated that he believed that they had lost one of the noblest women that the war had discovered. He said that they could not afford to lose such women. A representative from the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway Company, Mr Rutherford, stated that they would do anything they could to help with the investigation and also expressed his sympathies to the victim's family. Mabel Rogers, Florence's friend, gave evidence at the inquest about what she had seen on the day of her murder. She recounted the details of the man that she had noticed in the carriage and she told how she travelled down to the hospital to see Florence when she was in a critical condition was also revealed that Scotland Yard had become involved with the investigation and that they had discovered a new lead. It's reported in the Nottingham Journal on the 20th of January that a man who fit the description that had been distributed already had been spotted leaving the same train in Lewis. He was reportedly wearing a shabby light dust or rainproof coat which was all crumpled at the front as though he'd been sat on it on the train. He got off the train with his hands in his pockets and rushed along the platform, his head down. Inspector Hay from Scotland Yard was enlisted to try and trace his movements. It was also reported that a man had been detained at Dover. This man fit the description of the man seen on the train. The man had attracted attention as his passport appeared to be altered. He was believed to have been in London and travelled to Dover, stopping off in Canterbury on the way. This man was later released without charge. The police had enlisted the help of experts in the case, including Dr Bernard Spilsbury, who conducted a post-mortem examination along with surgeon Dr Beatty. It was believed that he did a special examination of her head in particular. The inquest was then adjourned until February the 4th, while investigations continued. Inspector Hay stated on the 24th of January that there were many clues in the case, one of which was a tip that a man had gone to a pub and paid with a blood-stained one-pound note. 
While police continued to narrow down any suspects in Florence's murder, her funeral took place. Many people close to Florence attended the funeral at St Saviour's Church Ealing, including many of her co-workers over the years. It's reported that there were huge crowds lining the streets, all the seats in the church were occupied and some people were even standing in the aisles. Wreaths were sent to the church from all of her colleagues and friends, including those people who she worked with during the war in France. A doctor who worked with Florence and was now a reporter wrote a tribute to her in the Times. In it he stated, As one of the doctors who worked with her in France from October 1914 onwards, it's a sad privilege to pay this small tribute to the memory of one of the most unselfish and self-sacrificing women I have ever met. It was clear that Florence had touched many people's lives and her death had devastated many people. This made it even more crucial for the police to try and track down whoever had murdered her. The inquest was resumed once again at the beginning of February and it was again led by Mr W. J. Glenister, the borough coroner, and it was opened at the Sessions Court in Hastings. One of the first witnesses to be called was Mabel Rogers, Florence's friend who was a crucial witness to what happened on the train. She once again testified about how the two women walked through the train until they found an empty carriage. She explained that a man came into the carriage and offered to open the door for her as she exited the train. She was questioned about the colour of his hair, height and what he was wearing. Miss Rogers also confirmed that Florence did have money with her that day and explained that she had jewellery on, including a necklace, rings and a brooch. A number of witnesses who worked at the train station or had been on the train were then called. Thomas Dryden, who was a chief engineer on the railway, produced a plan of the particular train that Florence had been travelling on. He explained that two coaches on the train would have been used as an exit, as those were the two coaches on the 11-carriage train that would have overlapped the platform. He also explained that he had had no report that anything had happened to the train that day, that the track had been examined from London to Lewis and nothing untoward had been found. Several men who had entered Florence's carriages at different times also testified about what they had seen when they entered. George Clout explained that he and a man called Thomas Ransom entered the carriage at Polgate. They sat down and Clout said that he did notice someone else sitting in the carriage with their head against the seat. Clout said that the carriage was poorly lit at this point and he couldn't really tell what the person was doing. He said he next looked at the person around 10 minutes after. He said he noticed that her position in the seat seemed odd and he looked a little closer. He said he then spotted what looked like a lot of blood on her face. He explained he told Thomas Ransom that something was wrong with her and it looked like she'd had a nasty knock, but Clout said that Ransom didn't seem to hear him. Clout, however, said he didn't do anything as the woman appeared to be breathing and her eyes were opening and shutting as though she was reading. Thomas Ransom confirmed this and said he didn't hear Clout's initial explanation of what the woman looked like as he had a cold at the time and didn't hear him. When they arrived at Bex Hill, Clout explained that he decided to tell the porter that there was something wrong with the woman, and then he stood at the carriage door so that no one could get on. He explained that he had noticed blood on her face, but nowhere else around the carriage. He said there was a small bag with a hat on top of it next to the woman. He stated the windows and doors were shut when he got on, and the blinds were down. He said it didn't look as though there had been a struggle, and confirmed that there was a communication card in the carriage. He confirmed that at this point when they arrived at Bex Hill, the woman did not say anything or make any efforts to communicate. Ernest Thomas had also been in the carriage that afternoon and confirmed much of what the other two men had stated. He elaborated and said there were streaks of blood on her face and they appeared dry. He also added that there was some blood on the cushion behind her head. George Walters, a guard on the train, said he was approached by a man who later turned out to be Ransom who said there was a problem in the carriage. When he observed Florence, he saw her fingers moving and she lifted one hand up. He said he noticed the bag next to her wasn't quite closed and it looked as though it had been rifled through. There was also a piece of a hair comb on the floor by her feet. He explained he saw blood on the seat behind her but also confirmed it didn't look as though there had been a struggle of any sort in the carriage. One thing that Clout and Thomas both noticed was that Florence's legs were exposed with both of her calves showing. 
At the end of this testimony, the coroner decided that the inquest was to be adjourned again until the following month. The resumed inquest happened in March 1920. Dr Bernard Spilsbury stated that the cause of death for Florence was blunt force trauma to the head. He believed that Florence had been hit on the head three times with an object that was possibly the butt of a revolver. He believed this to be the weapon as it appeared it had left a H shape on Florence's head. He believed that this could have been caused by an army issue Webley revolver. This did not, however, in 1920, narrow down the pool of suspects as it had only been two years since the war had ended. It was clear that the blows to the head had caused significant injury. This indicated that Florence's death had been violent. The inquest also heard from a new witness, a guard who was in charge of the train that Florence was on. He explained that when they stopped at Lewis, he got off the train and saw a man get out of the carriage in the Hastings end of the train. He said he only saw his face for a moment and it was dark. However, he said the man must have been around 25 to 30 years old and was wearing a waterproof coat. He asked the man if he had been told to get into the eastbound part of the train. He replied no, and then the man wasn't sure if he got back into another portion of the train or got off. The police did arrest a man in Eastbourne a few days after the murder, after he robbed a group of women at gunpoint. The gun had no bullets in it, but did have some bloodstains on the grip. Harry Duck, the guard, explained that he had been shown a man that he had been asked to identify, however he couldn't be sure of his identity. This man was the robber who had been arrested not long after the murder, and it was hoped that he would be able to identify him, however this was not possible. This information was useful for circumstantial evidence, however without an identification it didn't mean anything. In 1920 the police were also not able to check the blood to see if it were Florence's. Despite the fact that there was a severe lack of information about the suspect or what had really happened on the train, it was clear that whatever happened had not been the result of natural causes. The jury at the inquest returned a verdict of willful murder against person or persons unknown. The inquest, despite presenting some important witness testimony and giving the jury and the public more information, seemed to create more questions than answers. So what did the police really know about Florence's murder? The murder had clearly taken place before the train arrived at Polgate Station when the men got into the carriage. Harry Duck, the guard, explained that he believed it could have taken place in Mersham Tunnel, around 42 miles away as the train passed through there on its way out of London. This was part of the London Brighton Railway. The tunnel is just over a mile long and there would not be much light in there until the train emerged at the end. This tunnel was the site of a previous murder in 1905. 22-year-old Mary Money was found murdered in the tunnel and when she was found at about 11pm, her body was still warm. This led to an investigation into what could have possibly happened. But sadly, this crime still remains unsolved. I also covered this case as a Patreon bonus episode. This was a possible theory, as the lights would have been dim and there would not have been much chance for Florence to see the attack coming. The police believed that the motive for the murder had been robbery as some of her belongings were missing and there appeared to be no other reason why someone would have wanted to attack her. Florence's murder was national news due to the fact that she was such a respected person in her community but also the mysterious nature of the crime. The police did question several people in relation to Florence's murder but sadly this didn't lead to any progress in the case. It appeared to police that the murderer had waited for an opportune moment to rob Florence, stole her jewellery and money and then attacked her using the butt of a gun he had. It was believed that he may then have left the train at one of the stations. Was the murderer the man that Mabel Rogers had seen in Florence's compartment, or perhaps the man that was seen getting off the train at Lewis? After the inquest, police continued to look for any new clues about Florence's killer, however leads started to dry up not long after the murder. At Florence's inquest, a memorial for her was discussed. They wanted to raise £5,000 to extend the work of the Hammersmith District Nursing Association. This, it was said, was to commemorate in the most fitting way her career of devotion, unselfishness and good work. This indicated how much Florence really meant to her community and the good work that she had done for many people. 
In 2011, Rosemary Cook, an author and nurse, published a book about Florence's murder called The Nightingale Shaw Murder, Death of a World War Heroine. In this book, Rosemary Cook examines what happened to Florence and Bernard Spilsbury's involvement in the crime. She also explores the history of nursing before and after the war. This once again brought media attention to the case. In an article from the Scottish Daily Mail from 2018, it's reported that Rosemary Cook found an account from several passengers on the train. It's reported that she found an account of one of these passengers called John Smith from Brighton, who seemed to know more than he should have done. He said he saw Florence semi-huddled up with blood running down her face. He said he saw her hand moving and her bag placed at the side of her looked like it had been rifled through. This account appears remarkably similar to the account given by George Walters, a guard on the train at the time. This account was reported in several contemporary articles in 1920. Whether this was the same person and the accounts have been confused is unclear. There is also the possibility that the witness did indeed see Florence, or knew more information that he shouldn't have done. This would of course make John Smith a suspect. For anyone that wants to know more about Rosemary Cook's book, I will put the information in the show notes. Florence's case is certainly a mystery, and this is one where there is no real evidence or information to go on. It was a tragedy that someone who dedicated their life to helping others had their life taken away in such a brutal and unnecessary way, and I am so happy to be telling her story so that she doesn't get forgotten. Thanks for listening to today's episode. As always, thank you to everyone that continues to support the podcast by leaving us a five-star review wherever you listen. And thank you to all our Patreon supporters. If you want to support us on Patreon, you can get shout-outs in the show, stickers, postcards, and access to bonus episodes. The link is in the show notes. Please follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and you can also join our Facebook discussion group. If you want to suggest a case for future episodes, you can contact me on social media or email me at theunseenpod at gmail.com. As always, I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen. <laughs>